So my name is Ben Orenstein. I work at ThoughtBot in Boston, and I've come here to talk about refactoring, to show you some live coding, to do some vimming. I'm really excited. And so Marty uh, and the organizers of Rocky Mountain Ruby, turns out these are smart people, because they put me right after Sandy. And in an amazing, lucky coincidence, our talks fit together amazingly well. No coordination, but I'm just watching her talk going, this is exactly what I would want to have happen right before I go up and do what I'm about to do. So perfect, you guys lucked out. So um, two things before we get started. First of all, uh, this is not me lecturing at you, telling you the truth from the mountain. This is us pairing. I'm now pair programming with this room. So if you don't understand what I'm doing, please say something. If you disagree with what I'm doing, please say something. I love questions. Uh, you're not gonna mess up my flow. The point of this talk is not for me to get to the end of it. It's for you to learn something. So don't be shy. Shoot the hand up. Um, the second thing is, I want to tell you the most important part of my talk right now, just in case you tune out or fall asleep or something like that. So this idea, there's an idea. It's called Tell, Don't Ask. And the idea behind Tell, Don't Ask is it's better to send an object a message and have that object perform some work for you rather than ask the object about its state and make decisions on its behalf. That theme is going to run through all these examples that I'm about to show you. So if you remember just one thing, remember to consider tell, don't ask. It tends to lead to very good object-oriented code. So let's dive in. Let's write some code. Oh. All right. Once this projector boots back up, you're going to see a little bit of code that looks a lot like something I wrote recently. So take a second and just read this. Hmm. So you're probably getting the gist. So this is an orders report. And the, the goal of the report is to take a, a collection of orders and a start date and an end date, and then calculate the total sales that happen within that date range. Very basic sort of analytics type thing. Um, now, if I had written this code about a year ago, I probably would have stopped here. It's not terrible. I'd say it's about a B. Maybe it's a B minus. But over the last couple years, I've developed uh, some new ideas and some things that I would use to change this to make it better. So here's the first one. Um, check out line 12. We're creating a temp variable called orders within range. And then we grab from the collection of orders <clears throat> those that were placed within the date. Now, we have this variable in a temp. And lately, I've been extracting this. So I'm going to extract this temp variable into a private method instead. And I actually have a macro I recorded for this to save us a little time. So here's what it looks like now. Now line 12 just calls that private method, and we've extracted that logic into a method. Now, there's a couple benefits that we've already gotten here. This is a small change. We've just gone from a temp to a, a query method. But there's a couple benefits. The first is, ignoring the odd wrapping we have in place here, we went from one method with two lines to two methods with one line. Now, I'm not going to be ridiculous and say that's always a good idea, but it usually is. I'll take one-line methods all day long. I'm almost willing to say that methods longer than a line might be a smell. <laughs> now, a smell, it's important. Let me define what smell is before you get too ridiculous and start tweeting that quote and people flame me. Um, a code smell is something that indicates there may be a problem. A smell is not a problem. It's an indicator. I think methods longer than one, one line might be a code smell. So now. We've had one win. We've gone from two, one method, two lines, two methods to one line. That's good. Uh, the other thing we have here is we're more likely now to reuse this logic. So we have right now one method in our orders report that calculates total sales within date range. It's very likely that we're going to come along and add average sales within date range. Something later in this report is likely to need to calculate all the orders that are within that range again. Now that we've pulled this out into its own method, it can be reused by future methods. We've made this calculation more accessible. It's more likely that code we write later is going to be more dry. And there's a third win here. And this is actually, I think, one of my favorites, which is, let's look at that code, how it looked right before our refactoring, like this. For whatever reason, when you have a temp variable in a method, you can't help but read how it's implemented. If I was reading this, this method, I'm saying order with, orders within range. OK, how do we do that? OK, we look at the orders, and then we go through here. And I'm actually trying to figure out how it actually works. When it's just a call to a private method, 
I think you're way more likely to ignore how it's implemented for now. You say, OK, that's a private method. I'm just going to trust the guy that wrote this and his tests that orders within range in fact returns the orders that are within the range. And I'm going to move on to reading the rest of this method. So I think it's a, a readability win as well. Now, let's look for some other stuff we can improve. Let's go back down to this private method we just extracted. Another thing I've been doing lately is developing a strong intolerance for blocks or conditionals with and, and, or, or, or in them. I have almost always extract those these days. So we have the select here. And if you're reading the select, if you're reading the code, you can pretty quickly parse what it means. But if I were talking to you, I would say, from the orders, select all of them that were placed within the range. That's not exactly how this reads, right? So let's make it read better. So what if we said instead, let's, let's ask an order if it was placed uh, between two dates, the start date and the end date. I like this better. So now we are, uh, let's, let's move this down. I think we've got a small win here. We're sending a message to order as opposed to digging around in it. We're going we're gonna to move that calculation for, hey, are you placed between two dates into order? I don't want this report to know how to figure that stuff out. I'd rather just ask order. By the way, so I meant to mention, I have specs for all these examples. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples. They all have specs. First rule of refactoring, don't refactor code without specs. Just don't do it. Write the tests first if they're uncovered, and then refactor. So I'm going to be running my, my tests as we go to make sure they're right. Uh, so let's make sure this extraction works correctly. Uh, go back to where we were a second ago. Extraction worked correctly. OK. So now we're trying to write this new method called place between uh, undefined method. That's what we want to see. So let's go in here. So what does this look like? OK, this takes, whoops. This is going to take a start date and an end date. And it's going to, we're going to ask the order, is your placed at uh, after the start date and um, after the start date, yeah, and before the end date? Let's see if we're good. Back to green. Can I move this down? Let's see if that works. OK. Uh, yes. So now I've pulled out a little logic into order. I'm liking this code more. I think we're creeping up towards like B plus range. Uh, life is getting pretty good. Uh, but we've actually, in this extraction, created a new problem. So notice all the places we're passing start date and end date. We pass it into the orders report. And then from this method, we pass it into order. This pair of start date and end date is showing up in a lot of places. And when you have parameters or attributes that show up in a lot of places, there's a chance that they might be what's known as a data clump. And what you do with a data clump is you pull it into its own class. And a good way to check if you have a data clump is to say, if I have two pieces of data and I took one away, does the one that's left still make sense? And in this case, it doesn't. Because I'm asking, hey, order, were you placed between start date and nothing? That doesn't make any sense, right? So these two things are clumped together, so we should extract them. And that's going to get us a couple wins, and we'll talk about those as soon as we got it. So let's pull these out into a very simple class. And I'm going to start uh, in the spec. So here I have my start date, end date. Let's just turn this into a range. We'll call it date range. And we'll just throw them in there like this. And then in our over here, whoops. So now I have this new class called date range that takes a start at an end, and I'm passing that into the orders report. This blows up because date range doesn't exist, which is fair. Now date range exists. We get the wrong number of arguments because we're passing in some, very, uh, some initial attributes. So let's just use a struct real fast. Now we have a date range that takes those. Good. OK, so now we have, uh, we have an argument error here. We're now passing in just two and it expects three. So let's change this to take our range. You guys know Drew Neal, Drew Neal is in the audience, Vimcast guy. He's watching my Vimming very intensely, I'm sure. How am I doing, Drew? Good. Approval of, of, from Drew Neal. OK. Uh, so now we have a couple, one more place to change, a couple more places to change. So this now takes just the date range. I'm just threading this through these same, same calls that happened before. In here, we just take a date range now. And now, we, we ask the date range 
what the start date is, and what the end date is. And we're back to green. It's on one line. Cool. So we follow what happened here. Had that data clump, was two parameters, we pulled it out. Now it's one stupid class that's basically just a data container. So you might well ask, is this a win here? Uh, it actually is. So notice what happens to the parameter list in orders report and also that method with an order. We went from two parameter or three parameters to two. And you're saying, so? That's actually a big deal. And it's a big deal because of something called coupling. Now, coupling is the degree to which components in a system rely on each other. If A and B are completely uncoupled, you can change A as much as you want and never affect B. If A and B are tightly coupled, changes to A will impact B. Now, here's a, now there's a kind of coupling called parameter coupling, which means any time you pass a parameter into a method, the calling method is coupled through that parameter. And let me show you a quick example of what that looks like. So notify user of failure is coupled to print to console because notify user of failure has to pass in a parameter called failure that responds to two sentence, right? If I passed in nil into print to console, this would blow up because nil does not respond to two sentence. So as a result, notify user of failure actually has some knowledge about print to console. It is slightly coupled. There's coupling between these methods because it needs to assemble the right thing. Now imagine, print to console passed in two parameters. You can see that the coupling goes up. If it say I passed in a failure and uh, an email address to send a failure to, now the email address needs to respond to some method. Uh, and now the coupling between these two methods is increased. And if we went to three, it's even more, and four, it's even more, and five, it's even more. So this actually yields an interesting result, which is methods that take no parameters are better than methods that take one. Methods that take one are better than methods that take two, and so on, up the chain. So by pulling out that date range and take, slimming down our parameter lists, we have reduced the coupling between these components. So this actually is a win, and it's a pretty big win. But there's more. It also gives us a pretty handy place to hang behavior on. So now that I look at this code, uh, I'm loving it less and less. We've got this date range here, but we're asking order to determine if it was placed within a range. It seems like determining if things are placed within a range would be a good job for this new date range class. I can envision other th things other than orders wanting to know if uh, it happened within a certain range. So let's pull, uh, let's extract another method here. Um, let's write the code we wish we had, see how that works. So if you ask an order if it was placed within a date range, uh, let's just ask the date range, do you include um, my place at? This will blow up. Uh, and then we'll go into date range. And we'll take a date. And then we'll say, you're included in my date range if, uh, and I'm going to make use of Ruby ranges real quick. So we can actually say start date, end date, dot include date. That'll work because Ruby's awesome. Cool. So we're back to green. So that we've picked up another win from this date range class, which is a great place to hang date related behavior. Um, I've noticed a common thing among people that are sort of intermediate level of object oriented programming, which is they're a little bit hesitant to extract classes. And part of that is reasonable because to extract a class invites a little bit of indirection. Suddenly your code isn't in the same place, it's somewhere else. But most people err too far on being unwilling to extract classes. As I write code, I extract tiny classes. Notice that in Sandy's examples, she pulled out classes that had one method in them, and the code was greatly improved. Don't be afraid to pull out a tiny class that just has two data attributes, or even one. Maybe instead of passing around a string all the time that happens to represent a phone number implicitly, you create a phone number class that just has that same field. It makes things more clear. So don't be shy about extracting classes, methods. Those things are great to do. Most people don't do it quite enough. Lots of tiny classes. That's a good sign of an object-oriented system. OK, before we leave this example, uh, there's a couple small little things I want to change to make this slightly better. Um, first is this mess right here. 
So we find orders within range, and then, well, we're summing them. We're summing the amount. Um, this could be better. So first, let's pull out, uh, let's extract this into its own method. So uh, total sales, we'll call it. And I'll bring this all in here. It's going to need a parameter. Uh, extracted out the total sales. And then there's one last little thing that I can do in here with this inject, uh, thanks to Ruby 1.9 land, which is just this. Good. Now look at this. Check out my, check out my public API. It's one method called total sales within date range, and the body of that method reads total sales of orders within range. I love that in a public method. I love how this reads. If you want to know how either part of this works, you can dive down to the private methods. If you don't, you can read the method name, and the body is completely unsurprising. I love that. This is the kind of code I would check in. This is probably about where I'd stop. OK, I'm happy with this. I like life. Yeah, what's up? He wants to, yeah. He has to see orders within range. Oh, yeah, thank you. I forgot that. Good call. Um, now I want to ask it if it include, right? Date range, thank you. So, hey, date range, do you include? Uh, oh, right, do you include my play stat? Thank you. This is why it's good to have pairs. Boom, good, good call, exactly. So this is the problem where I write the method first as I sometimes forget to uh, go back and do it. Yeah, what's up? That's an interesting point. Interesting. That's awesome. So he's saying that uh, the include here on line 28, is uh, because I have that range of start date, end date, it's going to instantiate all the dates within that range and then ask if it's included in there. What well, I can use the cover question mark method, and that'll just instantiate the ends and check for that. That's, and that'll be way more efficient. That's cool. What's that? One nine only. So if you're a 187, well, what are you doing anyway, honestly? <laughs> <laughs> All right, a lot of hate on 187 in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> it's a Ruby version back from the Dark Ages. Okay. Um, so let me run my specs. I got a new spec in, in line now. Uh, okay. Time for a new example. Here is a modeling, a very simple modeling of a job site. Like we're, we're doing construction, let's say. This is a, an app to manage construction projects. Now, a job site has a location and it maybe has a contact. We maybe don't know who the contact is. So within job site, we have some checking to see if we have these contacts here. So when we get the name, we need to first make sure if the contact exists, and if not, we have a default for when they don't. Same thing for phone, and same thing for emailing a contact. We only ever do that if we actually have a real contact. Contact is a simple open struct down here. Um, so what's happening here? Why is this code not so good? So the first problem is it violates tell don't ask, which is something we started talking about earlier. So we would rather just tell contact or something else, hey, give me your name. Instead, we're asking, hey, contact, do you exist? And if you do, I'm going to call a name on you. And if you don't, I have a default, so don't worry about it. So this is the opposite of tell don't ask. This is ask don't tell. This is the wrong way. So and the problem here, the, the core problem here, is we're co-opting nil. We're asking nil to stand in for when there is no contact. That's actually what's happening here. When I create a job site with no contact, at contact becomes nil. And now I need to check for that presence of nil all over the place. So this code can be improved. And it can be improved with something called the null object pattern, which is one of my favorite new things that I've been using all over the place. So let's create a class that stands in for not having a customer as opposed to using nil for that purpose and all the ugliness that it entails. So let's add, when we don't have a contact, oops, let's add a null contact. Now this is going to blow up all over the place because I have tests that test where there's no, no, uh, no contact. Now let's write this null contact class. It looks like this. Now we have the right class, uh, but it doesn't have the methods we want on it. So let's define um, uh, name. And we'll say no name. 
phone. No phone. And now we get down to email, whoops. Don't hold undo. Now we get up, to, up here to email contact. And you notice that we only send it if contact exists. So I'm going to define this on contact, uh, deliver personalized email. Uh, body. I'm just going to have to do anything. I'm just going to define an empty method here. Let's see if our tests pass now. And they do. So now we have a null contact to stand in when there isn't a contact. And now we get to do the favorite thing of all programmers everywhere, which is what? Elite code. Elite code, absolutely. No one has ever not gotten that. Every audience I've asked that has gotten it instantaneously, just so you know. All right, so let's delete some code. Life is so good. If you don't like deleting code, I think you need a new career. This is the best part. Reindent those bad boys and rerun it again, and it still passes. So I just yanked out like 10 lines of code, maybe more, and everything still passes. So this is because, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So now we've created a, so Sandy talked about how send, you want to send messages to objects. We've, and what you can do is use the messages you want to send to pull new classes into existence. The new class we wanted to pull into existence was a class that stands in for the case where there's no contact. That's what null contact is down there. It defines what to do when, when contacts aren't there and possibly even just does nothing sometimes. And now, we're happily following tell, don't ask. We just tell different types of classes of contact what we want it to do. And also, we've moved a bunch of crap. So our code before, the true intent of the code was obscured with effectively uh, error handling or checking if contact exists. Now it's much more obvious what these methods are doing. They're shorter and they're clearer, and we've gotten rid of conditionals. This is what Stanley was talking about with replace conditional with polymorphism. This basically says, rather than have an if where you check things about the object and then decide what to do, have two classes and just send the same message to both ones and blow away that if, and life is good. There's a question somewhere over here? Yeah, um, so non-contact is just a base class, right? Would uh, would better be inherit from a contact or um, make a like, single person uh, like that? Yeah, so his question was, is just a simple plain old Ruby object right now. Would it be better to inherit from contact or possibly make a, uh, what was the second part? Singleton, great. Okay, so I'll answer in reverse order. So first, yes, it would be totally reasonable to turn this into a singleton. Why? Because how many null contacts are there? Just one, right? There's lots of contacts. There's only one null contact. So if you told me in a code review you wanted me to make that a singleton, I would do it for you. I might not write it that way uh, at first pass, but that's a reasonable point. The other part of your question was, would I inherit from contact? No, I would not inherit from contact. Um, I want to define exactly the API that null contact supports uh, manually. Because there may be a lot of additional methods on contact that I don't need to have on null contact. Um, there's a small chance I would do it, at, I would decorate contact with a null contact on top of it, but generally I'm not gonna inherit for that. Inheritance, for me, is a tool I reach for when nothing else is working. I actually am fairly anti-inheritance. And here's a great metaphor, this is my favorite metaphor I've heard recently. So, and don't take this as social commentary. So, composition, uh, so inheritance is like marriage, composition is like dating. So with an inherit, so or no, it's like it's like your it's it's like family. Inheritance, hold on. <laughs> Don't tweet that. I'm about to get in a lot of trouble. Okay, here it is. <laughs> inheritance is like marriage, and composition. It, <laughs> this is such a good. Yeah. Did I get it right? Okay, inheritance is like your family, right? You inherit something from the beginning. You, you are born as a subclass of a parent class. You cannot change that. It's fixed throughout your life. Composition is like relationships. They can come and go. They change throughout your lifetime. They're flexible. So composition is, al is basically always inherently gonna be more flexible than inheritance. It's much harder to get yourself in trouble painting yourself into a corner with composition. It definitely happens with inheritance. Saw the hands, maybe? Yeah. Really basic question. So for something like null logic, would you put that with your models, or would you put that in like a separate place, like a folder? Yep. Yep. So, he's, so the question was, where would I put this null content? Would I put it in app models? Yeah, I'd put it in app models. I'd put it in app models. If I had, if I had 50 of them, I might pull it into like app null objects, possibly. 
but generally I'm going to stick most stuff in app models. My personal rule for app, like app models versus lib stuff is stuff that is specific to my application lives in app models. Like business logic, all that kind of stuff is going to live there. The only thing I put in lib are things that I might extract or sort of general purpose things that I might use between projects. Personal rule, you guys can do what you like. Uh, other questions? Awesome, okay. Oh, one more example for you guys, and I'm gonna summarize and wrap up, and we're gonna get you to the break. So, uh, oh, one quick thing before we leave this. Who has code in their app right now that says something like, if current user, yada, yada, yada? Liars, raise your hands. <laughs> exactly. You probably have it in the view, you probably have it in application controller, it's probably throughout your app. Can you see how this might help that? So rather than have current user return a user when they're logged in and have it return nil when they're not, have it return a user when they're logged in and a different class when they're not. Then you can blow away the 50 conditionals that are complicating your code and just always send the same message. Say, hey, current user dot welcome message. And if they're logged in, it's one thing that this class responds to. And if they're not, it's something that this class responds to. It clean, this, this, pattern, this, this basic idea of polymorphism over conditionals cleans up a ton of code. This has been like one of the biggest tool uh, improvements that I've gotten from like a single concept or idea in a long time. Yeah, what's up? Is the current user usually the tends to view? So uh -huh. I'm displaying one partial for one for current user or not logged in. See, the beginning of the admin, right? Yep. Yep. So he's saying that this sort of breaks down in the view, and he's kind of right. Um, it can be tr sometimes I don't follow tell, don't ask in the view. Because effectively, a view is getting an object and pulling out things from it and showing them. So I'm not as rigorous about following tell, don't ask in the view. But when things get nasty and they start getting really conditionalized and ugly, I will often reach for some sort of presenter. And I'll pull that out into its own class uh, and then potentially use polymorphism from there. Right, exactly. So it isn't, isn't it a view's job to reflect state? So it's, it's going to be an asker. It's, it's, it's hard to not ask in the view. It's kind of the view's job. So I, exactly, I'm not as rigorous about it there. That's one of the things I've learned about programming maxims, which is I learn something, and it seems so simple and beautiful, and it works everywhere. And then I realize, no, it doesn't actually work everywhere. And you have to kind of get excited and then realize it breaks down in some places. So always question things. Like, tell, don't ask is a great principle. It is not a law. It's something you should consider when you're writing your code. It's not something that is always correct that you always must follow. And the view is one of the places where it sometimes it tends to break down a little bit. OK, so one more example. OK. Let's wrap this bad boy a little bit. OK. So one idea that makes it much easier to change code is to depend upon abstractions. Sandy said that exact phrase in her talk. And the reason depending upon abstractions makes code easy to change is because you can alter the details without affecting the calling code. In effect, this lowers coupling, right? If your public API uh, is simple and predictable, your coupling will end up lower. Um, if you hide those details where other code can't see them, can't know about them, can't accidentally get intertwined with them. Now, most people are pretty aware, are aware of this to a certain point. So, for instance, I imagine none of you, if you needed, so Braintree is a payment processing system. I imagine none of you, if you needed to make payments uh, through Braintree, which has an HTTP API, I would hope that none of you would uh, wire up like NetHttp and start shoving like posts down the, down the line, or even go lower and just like fire like binary down a socket. Like, no one would go down to that level, right? They know that that would be a bad abstraction. So you'd come up a level, and you'd probably do something like this, which is you'd reach for a, a gem that wrapped this up for you. And that's the right idea, because you want to depend upon abstractions. And a gem is an abstraction on top of Braintree's HTTP service. So I see code that looks like this in a lot of Rails apps. So we have a user, and there's a subscription amount, and we might want to charge user for a subscription. So we grab their Braintree ID based on their email, and then we charge them for the subscription amount. Maybe we create them as a customer for the first time. We use their email. And let's say also there's a refund. 
for some reason that also uses the Braintree gem. Only this time we need to grab a transaction ID so we can know which one to refund. Now this code is decent, but it can be better. And the issue here is this code depends on the Braintree gem. So we're abstracted away from the HTTP, but we now have our business logic code is concerned with which gem we're using and what that API looks like, and also the particularities of it. Why on line six does user need to know how to find itself within Braintree? So those details have leaked into our business logic about how, uh, about how Braintree works. So how can this be better? Well, almost all the time, when I'm working with an external service, I will write a very simple, very dumb wrapper around it. And this wrapper shields me from change. So in this case, let's say we wanted to switch to Stripe. OK, well, user and refund both need changes. There may be 100 other classes that all have various methods that call brain trees in certain ways, along with knowledge embedded inside them that all need to change. That change is painful. And that's a change that's reasonably likely to happen. Changing payment gateways happens. I've done it. So how do we shield against this? Simple, 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 simple. We depend upon abstractions. Here's the refactored code. I've pulled out this idea of a payment gateway with simple, well-named methods. It doesn't even have any state. These are just class methods. Here's my payment gateway. I'd put it in lib, as I said, because it's sort of a general purpose wrap around Braintree and something that I'm very likely to reuse. And now all those details are hidden within this class. And again, I said before, most people are, too, uh, are, are not willing to pull out enough classes. This is a great example of a simple class that takes five minutes to write that can potentially save you 40 hours later on. Not only that, but now that we have this class, if we're, imagine we're testing the old version, right? Uh, we're testing this old version. I want to make sure this works. I need to stub methods on Braintree Gen. That should give you the shivers. I do not want to stub methods on somebody else's library. Here, look at what user calls. It calls my methods. That I'm happy to stub. I'll stub those all day long. Now I'm shielded from change. My details are hidden, and testing is easier. If that's not a win, I don't know what is. All right, so I want to wrap up with a couple uh, final ideas about when do you do these refactorings? Because Sandy brought up a great point, which is you should refactor when it's going to save you money, when not doing so costs you money. And I think that's great. That's a good idea. If there's code that's never, ever going to change, why refactor it? But there's a couple, a couple other nuances that I'd like to bring up. Um, it's a great idea to refactor God objects. Now, what's a God object? Well, I'll show you. So this is a uh, app that I have anonymized to protect the guilty. And we're in the app models directory. Now, let's get a, a word count of all the lines for all these models, and then let's sort it. And here you see my hidden shame. Check out user and order and merchant. So this, this app has three God models. Now, what's a God, what's a God object? A God object is one of those objects that everything seems to rely on. Everything's calling methods on these things. They're giant. They seem to know a ton. And in Rails apps, you will almost always have two. One is user, and the other is whatever that application is about. If it's an e-commerce app, it's order. If it's a to-do to list app, it's a to-do. You almost always have two. This app happen, ha happens to have three. We got user, leading by a mile, and we got order and merchant. This is, of course, an e-commerce app. So order and merchant are both ugly. Period is now is a pretty big class, but it's, le it's trailing by so much, I'm going to call those top three my bad ones. Every time I touch code in a God object, I'm going to refactor it. If I need to add functionality to order, it's not going in order. It's going to go somewhere that order composes, or it's going to live somewhere else. And every time i got a spare minute, I'm going to be ripping stuff out of there all day long. God objects are what makes systems hard to change. You got something that everything relies on, which means that everything is coupled to each other through that object. It's always worth refactoring those objects. And this is such a simple way to determine what your God objects are. Just look at how many lines are in your models. So that's one great time, one great time and place to refactor. Uh, here's another one. High churn files. I touched on this earlier, and so did Sandy. Um, it's worth refactoring something when you change it a lot. So you might have the ugliest code in existence, but if it is literally never going to be, cha be changed and barely has to be read, it's probably not worth your time. So how do you find high churn files? Well, you look at your color display settings. <laughs> no, you look at this gem. It's called churn. 
uh, churn shows you for any given file how often it changes. It goes through your Git history or SVN if you are insane and uh, tells you how often it changes. So high churn files are great candidates for refactoring because it means you're in there a lot. It means they're a, bit of, it, they're, they're a source of constant change. So you would love to get in there and improve them, make that change easier, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully shield yourself from that change with some smart refactorings and some good code. And then there's one other place that is a great, um, a great place to look for refactorings, which is places you find bugs. Because a bug in code means that you didn't understand it the first time. It was too complicated for you to notice that there was a bug there. And the truth about bugs is that bugs love company. They tend to show up together. So if you have a file that you just keep finding problems in, it's probably a great candidate for refactoring. Thank you guys very much. You've been an awesome audience. Uh, last minute wrap up questions. What's that? Uh, I don't get the reference there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's asking about my tabs up top. This is um, terminal vim. So uh, these are, my tabs are shown up at the top as just like text. Is that what you're asking? I think that's stock vim. I don't think I've done anything like that. Is that true, Drew? Does it just look like that in terminal? He doesn't know. I think so, yeah. I don't think I've done anything crazy with that. If you just do tab E, it'll open up a new one looking like that. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. 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 Can I go back to my, yes, if I could go to the first example. We have time. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, he asked, so why did, he's asked why did I break a one line method, or one method with two lines down to two methods with one line? No. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, okay, so it was one line before, it's still one line, why is it better? Is that the question? Oh, now it's two methods with one line. Okay, yeah. So method count isn't always a good measure of goodness of code. Like, see now, before it was one line, but you had to basically read and understand all the details of that line. So I would argue that this is much easier to understand than it was before. I think the readability is improved. I'm totally willing to pull out, very willing to pull out, tiny little methods with good names to clarify code. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, supposed to having uh, classes that exist solely of uh, class methods? Yeah. Class yes. Uh, Yeah, that's a great question. I struggle with that myself. So he asked, he always heard that classes that exist solely of class methods are a smell. And that's what that wrapper is, that payment gateway that I built. Um, and I have also heard that. I think in this case, it's OK. I think, it's, like you said, it's a smell. It's an indication that something might be amiss. In this case, this is just kind of such a simple layer on top of something. I think it's all right. And I struggled to find a way to not do that. And nothing really seemed to make sense. Because it's sort of just a bundle of, of brain tree methods as opposed to having state of its own that needs to be dealt with. But I think also in that case, uh, you might want to swap it out or in different cases. Yeah. Different sure. Yeah, he's saying sometimes you might want to swap that out. Yeah, so I, I might have different payment gateways. Maybe we use brain tree sometimes and stripe other times, in which case I would probably have a, a gateway that you would instantiate and then inject into classes that use it. Yeah. yeah. Totally, yeah. You say that you can actually inject the class itself as an object into the place that's calling, and that's, that's definitely true. Yeah? However, I've got a colleague who's calling uh, classes as global functions because they really are. You just call them from anywhere. So I think if you think about them as global, then you don't want to do Yep, agreed. So, so class methods are effectively global functions. There's no state, they can be called anywhere. Uh, they are definitely a smell. Yep, worth considering. I'm comfortable with how they how that turned out though in this case. The, the namespaces. Yeah. <laughs> They're namespaces, yeah. Yeah, one more question. Your 
the turbulence gap? Uh, no. Michael Feathers, Chad Fowler, and Mark were the gap. Oh, right. The graph of in the different quadrants of what the host will get back. It's like, Michael's done some really interesting research on that. Cool. It's not just looking at churn, but it's like these classes are broken up, these classes are broken up. Gotcha. Cool. So another tool that got recommended was Michael Feathers and Chad Fowler Chur or Turbulence. It's a gem. Cool. Good recommendation. Thank you guys. Thanks very much. Enjoy the break.